so, uh, uh, Shem, God, God helps. Uh, difficulties are ending, and we are approaching full class mode, hopefully. Okay. So. Yes. Okay. No barking. Thank God. All right. All right, so Rabbi, if we run into some technical problems within 40 minutes, we will we will all have to reboot and do another 40 minutes. I'm gonna try to fix the problem though. Okay. Uh, Thank God. Um, okay, so we're gonna start actually fully start the book of Zechariah this week. God willing. Any questions before we do? Okay, so we're using the Milstein edition of the Twelve Prophets, the Art Scroll, and um, also have your Masoretic text of Tanakh nearby. All right, so um, we'll need a volunteer translator for chapter one. Any volunteers? I'll volunteer, Rabbi. Okay. Thank you for your mercy, Mercy. <laughs> You're welcome, Rabbi. All right. So um, I'll uh, I'll ask you to translate, and then I'll interrupt you uh, constantly. So please uh, forgive me. Okay. But with a person with the name Mercy, you know, you can push your luck sometimes. I guess. <laughs> All right. So first, I'll do the Hebrew. Let me first do the Hebrew prophecy of um, on verse one, and then you can translate verse one. Okay. Bechodesh Shemini, Bishnas Shtaim li the Dar Yavesh, Haya Devar Dunay El Zechariah Ben Berechia Ben Ido Hanavi Lemor. Okay, can you please translate uh, that verse? Yes. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of Hashem came to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Ido. The prophet saying. Very good. <clears throat> okay, so Zechariah uh, is a prophet, but there's also another Zechariah who's a prophet who's mentioned in the Book of Kings. So let's first look at the article commentary before continuing the chapter. It's on page 392 of the Milstein edition. Zechariah was one of the last prophets to deliver God's message to his people. In other words, until Mashiach comes. He was a contemporary of Haggai and Malachi and prophesied during the reign of Darius II. He was a member of the Anches Kinnis Zagadola, the men of the great assembly, the body of sages who led the Jewish people during the early years of the Second Temple era. From that formed the sages of the Talmud. He exhorts the people to repent their evil ways and chastises them for their lack of alacrity in rebuilding the temple, even though they had been given permission and support from the Persian king to do so. His prophecies deal with the entire period from his own day until the end of days. The commentaries agree that Zechariah's visions are so esoteric that many will not fully understand until the coming of, of Elijah the prophet, herald of the Messiah. In the eighth month, this is the Jewish month of Mar Cheshvan. This prophecy took place a short time before the construction of the second temple resume, resumed, for that did not begin until the 24th day of the ninth month, the month of Kisle. Uh, as per Haggai uh, chapter 2, verse 18. In the second year of Darius, this is Darius II, who is also referred to as Darius the Persian, who, according to the sages, was the son of King Ahasuerus and Queen Esther. He is not to, be, not to be confused with Darius I, Darius the Mede, who together with Cyrus conquered Babylon. Uh, we see the commentary on Daniel uh, chapter 9, verse 1. The date of Zechariah's prophecy is noted in order to indicate that the prophecy was specifically des designated for that time. 
or it was done that the Almighty inspired Darius to allow the rebuilding of the base of Mikdash. And he therefore sent word to the Jewish people via his prophets that the time had come to build. Mm -hmm. Now, Zechariah, the son of Berechia, he is not to be confused with Zechariah, the son of Yehoiada, the coin who prophesied during the days of King of Yoash, king of Judah, and who was assassinated at the command of the king by his fellow Israelites in the Holy Temple. And the Medrash on Lamentations discusses how um, the, the, the assassination of the prophet Zechariah ben Yehoiada was like the, the, uh, the straw that, that broke the, broke the camel's back. Uh, so it, um, uh, it endangered the people to, to bear a long exile. Because there's a, there was a specific curse given for anyone who were to kill a prophet and a, a priest of God both on the same day. And Zechariah ben Yehoiada was a Kohen. So when, they, they, when that prophet was assassinated, it was different from the other uh, prophets being assassinated because it fulfilled a, a curse. So this in part explains why the current exile is longer. Because again, the first, the first uh, exile of, uh, after the first temple lasted 70 years, and the Bnei Israel, children of Israel never fully returned to the land. A minority of the people returned. So therefore the Messianic prophecies could no longer refer to the second temple, they had to wait for a third temple. Hmm. So in other words, the entire process of the Beis Amikdash of Mashiach was delayed. And uh, in other words, the, um, the second temple was a, a gift from heaven more than fulfillment of the prophecies. So uh, often uh, when speaking of the second temple, it's really talking about the third temple because the second temple ne never fulfilled the actual prophecy. Uh, in addition, the, um, thank God, the, you know, Hashem is very merciful and he finds a way to make things work. So, if you think about it, really the, the exile following the destruction uh, of, of a coin and a priest in one day, a priest, sorry, a priest and a prophet in one day. Uh, so really, in a sense, it, it lasted over 2,400 years uh, because the, the second temple never fulfilled the complete prophecies of, of Mashiach. You understand? Uh, so to have the extra 420 years of the second temple's existence was, was the gift from heaven uh, in, in the second temple era, but it was not fulfillment of the messianic prophecies. So this Zechariah is different from that Zechariah. The Arts Royal Commentary continues, Zechariah, son of Berechia, he's not, the, yeah, we, we mentioned that, son of Edo, the prophet. The, the title prophet refers to Zechariah, however, it's possible that his grandfather, Edo, was a prophet as well. And indeed, there are those who say that he is the same Edo as a seer in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. And the prophet uh, Edo in uh, chapter 13 of 2 Chronicles, Radak. Barbanel suggests that scripture notes that Zechariah's ancestry, ancestry to teach that Zechariah merited many important prophecies because his, he descended from prophets. Although at times scripture refers to Zechariah as the son of Edo in Ezra chapter 5 and chapter 6, it is evident from here that Edo was the prophet's grandfather. Scripture occasionally identifies people by their grandfather's name rather than their father's, especially when the grandfather was a more famous figure than their father. Okay, and on that commentary by Art Scroll, um, I'm going to present an alternative uh, idea. Okay, so it says that Edo uh, was the grandfather of the prophets. Okay, so 
according to Abarbanel's school of thought, we don't look for people to, uh, in, in Tanakh and assume that they lived for hundreds of years. Okay, so let's look at the charts, timeline chart at the end of the book. If you have the Milstein edition of, um, of the 12 prophets, this would be on page 512, 512. It's the chart entitled The Jewish Monarchy. So I believe the Stone Edition also has this. Yes, on page 2026 in the bilingual Stone Edition Hebrew, English. Uh, page 2026, Appendix A would be the Jewish Monarchy chart, chart number four. Uh, here in the Art Scroll Milstein Edition, it is on page 512. Okay, so if you look at uh, the prophecies mentioned in, in the Chronicles. You'll note that uh, Edo was speaking uh, during the time, uh, immediately, uh, either during or following Rehavam's reign. Rehavam was the first king of Judah after King Solomon. And Rehavam, uh, and uh, sorry, and Edo, um, he died during the reign of King Yehoram. Okay, oh, that was about 50 years later. So, in, in circa around the year 3000 of the Hebrew calendar, that is when Edo lived. Here, we're talking about Zechariah, who was after the destruction of the first temple and prophesied during the year of the building of the, of the second temple. Second temple was, was 70 years after the exile of Babylon. Here in the art scroll, it says the destruction of the temple was in 3340, uh, 3338. And then 70 years later is the rebuilding of the temple. So there we have it, um, that Zechariah, the grandson of Edo, was approximately 400 years after the life of Edo. Unless we're not talking about the same Edo. So if Edo literally was his grandfather, and we're not assuming Edo lived 400 years, I'm not aware of any measure that says it explicitly, we don't assume, based on the principles of, of Barbanel, his exegesis style, we don't assume somebody lived 400 years unless there's a specific Maimar Chazal. At least if there's a Maimar Chazal, uh, a saying of the, the sages of the town, uh, the holy sages of the Talmud. So then, it's possible it was a it was a tradition. It was the actual uh, handed down story from the prophets. But if the if the the Talmud or Medrash doesn't record anything on that, then why would we assume uh, somebody lived four hundred years when it could easily be somebody else? There's probably been more than uh, one person in history named Edo. So therefore, if we are saying Edo is Edo the prophet as per Radak, then we have to say that Edo was not his grandfather as Arsroll says, but he was his great, great, great grandfather from 400 years ago. Okay. So you see the problem here is that Arsroll is, is quoting from Radak and Abarbanel who go in two different directions. You understand? So according to Barbanel, we cannot say he's, his, his grandfather was 400 years old. And according to Radak, it's a very Edo from 400 years ago. Consequently, we must say that uh, it's probably Edo, his grandfather. As the says, 
But if Arsenal is going to say this, I would I would have said this before you quote the other exegetes, you know, because now it's and now it's a little confusing as far as timeline goes. But again, if we are talking about the very same ego from Radak, to learn it according to Radak, we cannot say it was his grandfather. And that's okay. Again, Radak is a Rishon, one of the classical sages. So he must have a Makor for it. So the very fact Radak says it is a chance, there is a Medrash that says it was the actual Edo. Okay, so now if it was the actual Edo, we would have to find the Medrash to not assume, according to the Barbanel style, that it, it was uh, someone else that he did not live 400 years. But the fact that Radak does say it, indicates maybe Radak had access to a medrash that um, is currently hidden from us other than Radak's comments because of the, the difficulty of exile and all the book burnings after generation after generation of book burnings. Uh, but thank God it was at least recorded in Radak. So this is something of a slight mystery. However, um, it's um, interesting uh, to, to, to note. So Edo is either the grandfather, in which case is not the, not likely the prophet from long ago, except according to Radak, it has to be the prophet from long ago. Okay. <laughs> now it's simpler to not think about all this, but it's not as accurate. Okay, so now we know, we simply have to find out the nature of the, the source of the Radak, um, Perhaps when Mashiach comes, if not sooner, if anyone heard of a, a medrash that goes according to that logic, uh, please let me know. Okay. Okay, so this is not the Zechariah who was slain, assassinated, and caused uh, a difficult difficulties in the exile. This was a the different Zechariah who came uh, and in, in merit of the prophet Edo, uh, apparently, according to Radak. Okay, so now if if you've if you're familiar with the twelve prophets, Zechariah is the only other book as long as Hosea. Hosea is uh, fourteen chapters, and so is Zechariah, Zechariah. All right, let's continue with the original prophecy and then the masterful uh, translation by Our Scroll and Mercy. Okay, here we go. Verse two. Katsaf Adonai Adonai Elai Adonai Alehem Amar Asher Paru Alehem and Nabim Harishonim Lemor, Komar Dunatsvos, Shubu Nami Darhechem Haroim, Maalehem Haroim, Lo Shamu Vlohi Shibu Elai Numa Dunai. Avosechem Ayehem Banabim Hala Olam Ichu. Achtavarai Vukai Asher Tsivisi Savadai Hanabim Halo Isigu Avosechem. We are Shubu Vemru. Kashir Zamaman Natsvos Lasa Uslanu Kidrachenu Uchamaalalenu Kinasa Itanu. Okay, Mercy, can you translate verses uh, two through six? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Hashem became wrathful with your fathers, wrath. Say to the people, Thus said Hashem, Master of Legions. Return unto me, the word of Hashem, Master of Legions, and I will return unto you, said Hashem, Master of Legions. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the prophets of old called out, saying, Thus said Hashem, Master of Legions, return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen nor pay attention to me, the word of Hashem. Your forefathers, where are they? And as for the prophets, could they live forever? However, my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, 
did they not befall your fathers? They repented and said, just as Hashem, master of legions, thought to do to us according to our ways and our deeds, so he did with us. So if, if even the righteous uh, prophets, uh, verse five, if even the righteous prophets, you know, uh, couldn't live forever, so, um, you know, how, in other words, how, how, how far do you want to push your, your spiritual luck, so to speak, uh, and um, not serve God correctly? Um, you know, utopia comes after the process of life in this world. Uh, but only if people are good. So if even a prophet could die, so why are you why are you uh, not um, returning to to God faster? And it's it's really an amazing thing that um, you know the supposition is is very fascinating that if a person even spoke. To a word that God spoke, how is it possible for him to die? It doesn't make sense because God is the, you know, the living God. Uh, but that is how powerful human free will is, that humans were able to program the world to, uh, to be able to bear the concept of death, which is ungodly because God doesn't die. Uh, so therefore, the human choice for, for for, for sin and death it is constantly pushing against human efforts for spirituality, even to the point that a prophet of God is not guaranteed to live forever. In the current world, of course, in the next world, they are. But it's, it's just, um, it's amazing that there could be a world uh, that um, it's possible to die. If, if you know God, it, you know, it's, it's, it's his power is, is without limit. But it's because God himself created that world. Uh, it's effectively like, like some, someone set up a computer with a powerful program, and then someone made choices in that program, and now the computer only does certain things. So, it, uh, you know, it was programmed to be affected by the user. So... That's what happened. But it's just counterintuitive to the nature of the creator, that uh, death itself. And uh, the prophet said, uh, death will end for eternity. And so it's, it's just a temporary stage uh, in this world. So the, the world in the future where people don't die anymore, that occurs following the Mashiach time. According to the, uh, the Medrash, the Sifri, uh, there, there's three generations in Mashiach's time. And uh, Mashiach has to uh, rule, his son has to rule, and his son has to rule. So the, after the grandson of Mashiach rules, then it's possible for the world to enter a stage where people stop dying. But there has to be consistency of serving God generation after generation, at least for three generations, to counteract all the evil of all the generations uh, since uh, the first, first man and woman. Okay, continuing in the original prophecy from verse 7. Your master in Baraba, Lashte Asar Chodesh, Hu Chodesh Shabbat, Vishnas Stein Ledor Yavesh, Haya Devard and I, Alzahaya Ben Berechia Ben Ido, and Abi Lemor. For Isi Halela, Vine Ish Brochev Al Sus Adom, who omed Ben Hadassim. Asher ba matzula, b'acharav susim adumim, srukim ulevanim. Ba'omar ma ele adoni, ba'omar elai hamalach adover bi, ani ar eko ma he ma ele. Ba'yan ha'ish 
העומד בין ההדסים, ויאמר, אלה אשר שלח אדוני להיסהלך בארץ, ויענו אס המלך, אס מלך אדוני, העומד בין ההדסים, ויאמרו, הלכנו בארץ, והנה כל הארץ יושב בשל קטס. ויען מלך אדוני ויאמר, ויאמר אדוני צבוס עד מסעיה אתה, לא שרחי מירושלים, ואיס ערי יהודה אשר זעמת זה שבעים שנה. ויען אדוני אס המלך, הדובר בי דברים טובים, דברים ניחומים. Okay, can you please translate verses 7 through, verses, through verse 13? 7 through 13. Uh, Mercy, can you, is your mute button on? I'm so sorry, I'm reading along here. <laughs> Practice okay. is good. Practice is good. <laughs> here we go. Let's start again. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word from of Hashem came to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo, the prophet, saying, I saw in a vision the night. There was a man riding upon a red horse, and he was standing among myrtle bushes that were in a pool of water. Behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who was speaking to me said to me, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtles spoke up and said, these are the ones whom Hashem has sent to travel about the earth. Then they spoke up to the angel of Hashem who was standing among the myrtles and said, we have traveled about about the earth, and behold, all the earth sits still and is at rest. You want me to read to 13? Yes. Okay. The angel of Hashem then spoke up and said, Hashem, master of legions, until when will you not have mercy upon Jerusalem and upon the cities of Judah, which you have spurned for the 70 years? Hashem then. Hashem then answered favorable things to the angel who was speaking to me words of comfort. Very good. Okay, so uh, now verse 12, if you're looking at this uh, literally as, as a prophecy, Verse 12 seems like a sudden change of pace. But for exegesis, this should be a warning sign to you. Okay, what I just read was allegorical. Now, what could the allegory possibly mean? So verse 12 explains the opposites. In other words, when will you not have mercy in Jerusalem? So in other words, the allegory we read, verses 7 through 11, must have been something against Jerusalem. So let's look at the commentary. Uh, in verse 8, long commentary. I think I'll just quote some of it. Uh, so according to Rashi, this is talking about the, the ba Babylonia and the Chaldeans and uh, Persians, uh, media. Uh, then further down towards the bottom of the page on 395, uh, Rabbi Eliezer of Ogensi interprets these three colors as symbolizing the king kingdoms of Persia, Greece, and Rome. Uh, since it's not above that, that of Babylonia had already passed from the scene. Remember, this is the, the year of the second temple's building. The mightiest of these at the height of the glory was Persia which is represented by the strong color red. Greece was weaker than Persia. Did you know that? Greece was weaker than Persia. Uh, people think of Alexander the Great, but even though they conquered a lot, so did the Persians. The Persians had 127 provinces. 
uh, and is therefore represented by a hue of red and white. Rome, although it was ultimately became the mightiest of all, reached that power only through the combined strength of its many vassals. Alone, it was the weakest of the three, actually. And the Roman exile is when you had a, um, an echo of Rome in Germany. Uh, we see that the Rome, it's, it depended on its vassal states to grow in power. And Germany in World War II depended on uh, the, the places it conquered to, to help them with the, the uh, final plan. Uh, we see that in Poland, most of the people who were against the Jews were not German. So that, that was uh, pretty scary, but it was a continuation of the process that began with Rome. It was the same model. Uh, German, Germany is actually cousins of Rome, both of them descendants of, of Esau, and um, which is separate from the, the northern, uh, at the, in the old days, the, the northern tribes had um, uh, different people of different, uh, more Slavic nations there, but um, so the actual capital city of Rome and, and Germany was founded by descendants of, of Asa. Okay, so this is a very long commentary, thank God, by Art Scroll. It's, it's very nice. Uh, but it's a bit tangential to the, the meaning of the entire prophecy entire chapter. So we're going to skip that. I recommend you uh, uh, try to pick up a copy of this book if you don't have it yet. Mostly an edition, mostly an edition on the prophets. Okay, so the, the angel of Hashem is, uh, is the one speaking what, about it's been 70 years since the exile would end. We see that uh, in the previous book, Haggai, uh, Haggai, the prophecy began two months earlier. Um, but when, when Haggai was speaking, to Zerubbabel, if you notice, it's interesting, when you go to a different book, you learn about the previous book you study. So there's another layer to Haggai. If you note, there were two different dates in Haggai. So it starts out on page 375 of the article Milstein. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, first day of the month, the word of Hashem, on the first day of the month, the word of Hashem came through uh, Haggai, the prophet to, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judea, and to Joshua, son of Jehoad, Zadok, the Kohen Gadol, high priest, saying. Okay, that is in the first verse of Haggai. Then in the second chapter of Haggai, in the 10th verse, it says, on the 24th of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, same year, the word of Hashem came to Haggai, the prophet, saying. Okay, so Haggai has the sixth month and the ninth month, right? Okay, let's go back to Zechariah. The first verse, remember, said eighth month, second year. So the first chapter of Haggai came before our current chapter of Zechariah 1. The second chapter of Haggai came immediately after the first chapter of Zechariah 1. So very interesting. That so it's like um, almost like uh, in a sense like, like uh, competing or or you know taking turn taking turns to prophesy. But it was three months in a row. Haggai one, Zechariah one, Haggai two. Interesting. So just keep this in mind. Uh, so in in Haggai one. It mentions it's time for the temple to be rebuilt. So this prophecy occurs in Zechariah 1, occurs the next month after 
Chagai said, uh, declared the time for the rebuilding of the temple is, uh, has occurred. So it wouldn't make sense for the prophet to be pleading on behalf of Israel. He's just overhearing a commentary between, um, between God and his angel. You understand? If the prophecy had said, you know, the prophet was talking with God, so then it, it would it would have been a contradiction to the dating, to the dateline. But the dateline is perfect because uh, it's not talking about Zechariah saying, when will you redeem us after Haggai just prophesied the redemption is now. You understand? So it fits in. This is why it's a third person discussion. In addition, there's a medrash that says the usually the more esoteric a, a, a prophecy is, that means it's not as high a level as a more clear prophecy. So you see the, the prophecies of Moses were clear, like a conversation, God speaking us directly. I've told you what is good for you. You know, that God is talking straight out, right? Also, we find similar. Uh, in in uh, Jeremiah and and Isaiah, uh, similar clear direct speech. Also, you know Samuel. So these prophets are on a different tier. But whenever you see a prophet goes into more and more allegories, he's not at the same level. So we find a lot of allegories in the book of Zechariah and the book of Daniel. So that means they are not at the same level. As, as the other prophets, but they're still, they gave eternal prophecies. So sometimes uh, God chooses people to do certain things out of righteousness that they have done, not out of uh, preparation level. If someone, you know, like works out, they're going to be stronger than someone who doesn't work out usually. But it's possible that, you know, someone was given a chance to do something because, you know, he won a lottery or something. So as far as relating prophecy goes, the main thing is that you were blessed to do it <laughs> so that uh, uh, you could contribute to such a wonderful thing of, of uh, teaching the world God's will for, for eternity. Uh, but uh, there are different levels. So the, the prophets like, of course, Moses was the highest. But prophets like like uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah are on a higher level uh, than than uh, many other prophets. So uh, again, the farther you get from Moses's level, the more you're going to have more more and more allegories. And when you have more allegories, you're more dependent on having a good exegesis. You need more commentaries to understand it. Otherwise, you don't you don't know where it's going. Just here in the first chapter already. You know why is he suddenly talking about Jerusalem if if they we're just talking about um, these allegorical things? So um, allegories means an indirect prophecy. You know, a direct prophecy kind of enters a person's heart and tells them what to do to change things. But what about if somebody doesn't want to listen to you? Sometimes the best way to make them listen to you is to whisper. And the whisper carries longer than a, a word. Because a word that, oh, it's talking, I'm just going to, you know, play my video game, whatever. But then he whispers, what'd you say? You know, so... That, I think, is what Hashem is doing. He brings a prophet who is more allegorical at a specific time because maybe that's what that generation needed to hear. Again, it was a time of redemption, and a majority of the people chose not to be redeemed. Terrifying. But we found out uh, from the, the commentaries on Zerubbabel and Haggai that there was uh, powerful um, institutions of Torah learning and, and Zerubbabel himself returned to Babylon uh, so he could teach his children Torah at a higher level than was possible 
in the um, in the nascent uh, uh, nascent uh, state that was forming in Israel at the time. So uh, it's fascinating. Good things to keep in mind. Uh, any questions before before we continue with the chapter? Questions? Okay. So words of comfort. Words of comfort sounds good. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll read the Hebrew verses fourteen through seventeen. Vayomer Eli Hamalach Hadover B Karale Mor Ko Amar Donatzvos Kinesi Yerushalayim Lutzion Kin Ag Gedola Kesef Gedola Ni Kotze Al Hagoyim Hashananim Hashani Kotzafti Maat Vehema Azru Lara. Lachain Koamar Adnoi Shavti Lurshlain Barachamim, Basi Bona Ba. New Mandanites Vos, the Kavi Note Al Yurshlain, Otra Limor, Koamar Adnoites Vos, Ot Futsena, Orai Mito, Nicham Adnoi Od Essium, Lachar Od Birushlain. Okay, Mercy, can you translate verses 14 through the end of the chapter? Yes. Thank you. The angel who was speaking to me then said to me, call out saying, thus said Hashem, master of legions, I have become zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, a great zeal, and I am wrathful, a great wrath against the complacent nations who, when I became slightly wrathful, augmented the evil. Therefore, thus said Hashem, I have returned to Jerusalem in mercy. My temple will be rebuilt in it, the word of Hashem, master of legions, and a plumb line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. Call out again, saying, Thus said Hashem, master of legions, my cities will once again spread out with bounty. Hashem will have mercy on Zion once again, and he will choose Jerusalem once again. Very nice. So so in verse 12, the angel said, will you not have mercy? And then Hashem says, uh, effectively, mercy, mercy. Uh, He says mercy two verses in a row. Uh, But let's first look at the, um, at uh, verse 15. I am wrathful, a great wrath against the complacent nations, who, when I became slightly wrathful, augmented the evil. Augmented the evil. So, based on this concept, uh, when someone was complaining about the Holocaust, now back in the 70s and 80s, people were, were, um, there were more, People who are agnostic, angry with God for the Holocaust uh, because of the, the level of cruelty involved. So the, this verse answers it. Remember, ver, the verse before said not mercy. And here we're talking about the augmentation of evil by the nation that is uh, oppressing Israel. So there's an aspect of free will. That's why it's good to avoid being in the in the control of evil people, because they have free will. It's they can potentially affect uh, the good person that they're controlling. So the Nazis use the, the absolute limit of their ability to be cruel to the Jewish people. So th- that is the evil that people did based on the system that people chose when they generation after generation chose evil. And God remade the world with the family of Noah and then generation after generation people chose evil until Abraham. And then he and his son and his grandson were able to establish a family that would serve God completely according to his will. And if they didn't serve God completely, they were willing to be punished for it. But that they, they should be worthy to be the servants of God. 
so if if God forbid a person gets involved with with a bad path, they should certainly avoid those evils that allows them to be handed over uh, to a human to punish them. It's better God is the, the form of punishment, not a human. Remember the um, the offer that was given to King David after he sinned um, with the counting of the people. Okay, so this is in chapter 24 of 2 Samuel, chapter 24, 2 Samuel. It's in the Art Scroll uh, Bilingual Stone Edition. This would be page 790, 791. Let's look, look at uh, verse 10 onward. David's heart smote him after having counted the people. And David said to Hashem, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. This is a, a there's an explicit commandment to not do that. And but um, he was confused because uh, Hashem wanted to punish the people. It says in Proverbs that uh, the heart of the king is in the hands of God to do with as he will. Uh, so King David is not credited as having done a great sin here directly, but he took responsibility for the sin because it came out of his own mouth, the, the commandments to, um, uh, to do this. Now, let's look for, keep a, thing, a finger in the page here and look at chapter 21 of Proverbs in the article Bilingual. This is page 1598, 1599. First verse of Proverbs uh, in chapter 21, like streams of water is the heart of a king in the hands of Hashem, wherever he wishes, he directs it. So a king, uh, back to the, let's go back to 2 Samuel. So king has limited free will. His free will is affected by the needs of the people. But this time the people needed to, a punishment. So King David was forced to make a mistake. So there, there's no, we don't find any massive ethical discussion in, in uh, the commentaries or the Talmud even about this. It was not considered really David's sin, but it's the, it was caused by the needs, the spiritual needs of the people at the time to be punished. So kings, David's heart smote him after having counted the people. And David said to Hashem, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. Now, Hashem, please remove the sin of your servant, for I, I have acted foolish, very foolish. Took responsibility and blamed himself for this decree against the people. David arose the next morning, and the word of Hashem had come to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus is Hashem, I am holding three things upon you. Choose for yourself one of them, and I shall do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, he said, would you rather have seven years of famine come to your land or three months of fleeing from your enemy while he pursues you or three days of pestilence in your land? That means plague. Now determine and consider what answer I should return to the one who sent me. So that's a choice, seven years of famine 
three months of fleeing from an enemy, or just three days, but of, of a plague, which could wipe out many, in, in, you know. So, in the case of the enemy, so humans can be cruel, this free will. So, therefore, it's not likely David would choose that. So the real question is, would he choose seven years of famine, a, a um, more gentle but difficult uh, long-term problem, or would he choose um, a virus, a plague? So David in verse 14, 2 Samuel chapter 24, David said to Gad, I'm extreme, exceedingly distressed. Let us fall into the hands of Hashem, for his mercies are abundant. Let me not fall into human hands. So he did not ask for uh, the, the bad thing directly. He asked indirectly just that God should give the most merciful uh, form, but certainly not into the hands of a, of a human hand. So Hashem sent a pestilence in Israel from morning until the set time. There died from the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. So for mercy, for mercy's sake, God did not send the enemy who could be cruel. And for mercy's sake, Hashem did not send the famine. Now, generally speaking, it's better to be hit with pebbles than a boulder. So why would God choose a virus instead of the pebble-like um, punishment of, of, the, of the many years of famine? Because we see that the when there's a famine, what is the result? What is the natural uh, natural economic result? Is that the person or country uh, is now dependent on their neighbors to purchase to purchase food? As we see, the the, uh, the Jacob and his sons eventually moved to Egypt. So Egypt had complete control over Jacob and his sons in a time of uh, a famine. So therefore, in other words, if the famine would be something where it's only from heaven and they would not be dependent on another nation, who can be cruel to them? So therefore, David would, would take that. But if not, if it's a regular famine where, where the, this nation could be dependent on that nation, David wouldn't want that. So rather than um, saying a conditional yes, he said, whatever fulfills this, please do. In other words, just, just your choice, Hashem, not the, the wicked nation. Okay? So we see this here in this concept here in uh, Zechariah 1, chapter uh, 15. And I am wrathful, a great wrath against the complacent nations who, when I became slightly wrathful, augmented the evil. So humans have the capacity to add on to the suffering of someone else. And David wanted no part of that. So even a virus where people die is better than, of course, uh, a Holocaust. Thank God, it's, 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 it's beautiful when the righteous are also wise, like David. Another factor that it was the sin of the people, not David, is because David didn't get ill. Uh, you know, so if, if it was truly his fault, uh, you know, measure for measure, uh, he caused everyone to get sick. So when, why did he not get sick? But it was not really his fault, even uh, if he had a part in it, but it wasn't his choice. Okay, so this con con concept is very important. So therefore, I explained to someone who was um, angry with Hashem for the Holocaust, uh, don't ask yourself, 
don't don't focus too much on why what God did or didn't do during the Holocaust. What did people do or not do during the Holocaust? How come every nation, even America, refused to let the Jews escape from Germany? England took people off the shores of, of Israel and sent them back to Italy and, and the Nazi regime. So that's, that's a better question. So we have to rely on the mercies of Hashem and not assume that people will be perfect. But relying on the mercies of Hashem does not mean taking any advantage of his kindness. So, so you know, unfortunately, that's, that's effectively what happened. That people uh, were complacent and then once they were handed over to someone who's clearly an Ad Hashem, then they understood the difference between mercy and not mercy. But um, all we have to do is just serve God right and guaranteed mercy. Now, you know, a lot of people buy a lottery ticket on the small chance they can win. But what if you are guaranteed 100%, just do this and you'll get that? Well, people are, they're guaranteed to have good blessings and, and often even in this world, not just for eternity in the next world. And yet not everyone chooses good. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to understand, except that uh, people uh, allow themselves to not fully believe in God so that they could continue whatever lifestyle they want to do. But it said at the end of Habakkuk, where is it? Where is it the end of the second chapter. So in, ver in chapter three of Habakkuk, God came from the south, the Holy One from the Mount, from Mount Karan, Salah. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. So there are times when it becomes more difficult for people to ignore spirituality. And in chapter two, Verse 14 in Habakkuk, uh, it says, For the earth will be filled with knowledge of Hashem's glory as the waters cover the seabed. So that's uh, referring to Mashiach time. Now, when you see these ideas, how is it possible for the earth to be filled with the knowledge of Hashem if there are not humans there to perceive the knowledge? So that, that's a very powerful indication that there has to be people throughout the world alive and not destroyed. So it's only possible to come to 
uh, an assumption of the destruction of the majority of the human race if somebody ignores that prophecy from Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. Next time you hear somebody overemphasize destruction of, of, uh, of all life or whatever, except for a, a few a few hundred thousand, whatever the case may be, according to their ideas, uh, just say, well, how does the entire world get covered with the knowledge of God if people aren't alive to have the knowledge? You know, if you, if you were to put a, a, a stack of Bibles reaching to the heavens in a zoo and only let the animals be there to take the books if they want to, not one book may open. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's amazing. So you need humans to have the knowledge of God spread throughout the world. You understand? And to overemphasize the idea of a destruction before Sheikh comes would be to go to her heretical lengths. It's a heresy against the Torah to say that uh, most people would die. There has to be survivors, or how does the world get covered with God's knowledge? You have to have humans, otherwise it's 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 just a it's a closed book in a zoo. Right? Nothing is happening. See that? That's a very powerful implication. So um, now, if you ever hear a, a rabbi who's religious overemphasize uh, destruction, he's only doing that to help people do repentance. However, it's an inferior exegesis. A superior exegesis assumes a lot of people will be alive. Now, now teach the Torah. Understand? Uh, but, for example, people in the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001, uh, you know, some of them made it out, many of them didn't. But for the most part, it was people in that building who were in danger. Most of the earth were not in danger. Some people in the Pentagon were in danger. Some people in an airplane over Pennsylvania were in danger. But most people were not in danger on that day. Uh, somebody raised a hand. Who's raising a hand? Please unmute your mic and say something. Oh, that, that was me, but I was, I'll wait till you finish your what you're talking about now oh it's just so it's just when when there's a prophecy of destruction it cannot mean the entire world it cannot mean the entire human population there has to be survivors and it's unlikely that most of the that all the survivors will be fully religious and in fact when here in our chapter we mentioned mercy mercy verses 16 and 17 and who needs mercy? Do the perfectly righteous need mercy? We all need mercy. So now, assumption of the destruction of the vast majority of the human population is a heresy against Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, and Zechariah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Mercy, mercy. And we mentioned last week, of course, uh, that this is also in Psalm 102 and Deuteronomy chapter 30, mercy in the end of days is predicted. So you can't, you can't go over it literally. However, um, even, even good people were in the, in the uh, trade center when, when it was destroyed, you know, and they died. So... You don't want to push your luck, quote unquote, uh, so to speak. Um, but have faith in the mercy of God. Yes, Shirley. Uh, your mic is muted. Yes. No, I, I, I was just wondering why, why men, humans, have to blame God for everything. It's always, it's always blaming him. When the certain situation happens, it's obvious that it was the people that caused it, you know, but they want to blame God for everything. 
I mean, like I have some that going on in my family right now. Um, a certain person saying because their mother died when they were born that they blame God and they will they don't want to have anything to do with them. So why God didn't cause that? The doctor did. And um, why do they blame God and refuse God? That's exactly. it, and then it's that way for everything, though. Exactly. Our, in our same the very chapter, Zechariah one, it's mentioned even prophets of God die. Yeah. And it's mentioned there should be mercy, and it's mentioned humans may not be the source of that mercy. So, in other words, mercy comes primarily from heaven. It's a source of mm -hmm. mercy. So, uh, if if people just uh, understood this chapter, you know, so mm -hmm. maybe they wouldn't um, expect things that uh, are are not realistic. God left humans to program it, uh, this world, and generation after generation chose to conceal themselves from God uh, in, in, in their minds, in their own minds. Yeah. Rather than look at the reality of God, they started to look at um, other forms of worship that did not have ethical uh, and moral obligations attached to them. Yeah, that always has amazed me. Yeah, so now if, okay, so maybe a parable for, for idolatry uh, would be like if somebody is listening to loud music in the middle of a conversation. Uh, so in the days when the earth was first formed and there are no foreign philosophies, why would you assume there's not a creator? When was the last time a bucket of, of paint was kicked over and suddenly there's a painting? It, it, it's not logical to assume there's not a creator. Um, and then as a child, you, you, you want food and you just see a bunch of grain in the house. Then your, your mom has to pound it into powder, and powder aka, AKA flour, and, and, you know, and do stuff to it until it finally becomes bread. Uh, so it doesn't get there by itself. So if, if even a piece of bread needs a creator, certainly the world needs a creator. So it's, it's, that is logic. It's basic logic without foreign philosophies involved, without, uh, it, without a uh, immoral agenda attached. But if you have a very powerful, uh, very powerful conversation with someone, and you don't like the direction it's taking you in, and they're not going anywhere, and you can't leave, maybe the solution to try to avoid what they're saying is to put on very loud headphones, uh, less, less some music. Um, it may not be respectful, but it's the only way to, to drown out the, the, the content of their words. And yeah, you understand the metaphor drown out, and then God brought a flood, measure for measure. They tried to drown out spirituality for ground for, for, from God, and so they too were drowned in the generation of the flood. Uh, your hand is raised, Shirley. Uh, your your mic is muted. I'm sorry, I forgot to take the hand away. Okay. Oh, let me hand it to you. <laughs> I don't right. know how to take it down. Okay. So again, we, we see here a double language of mercy in regards to the, the final uh, redemption. Therefore, uh, verse 16 and 17, therefore, thus said Hashem, I, will have, I have returned to Jerusalem in mercy. My temple will be rebuilt in it. The word of Hashem, Master of Legions, the plumb line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. I have returned. Present tense. 
in the second year of Daryavish, Darius. Call out again, saying, Thus said Hashem, Master of Legions, my cities will once again spread out with bounty. Hashem will have mercy on Zion once again, and he will choose Jerusalem once again. Future tense. Okay, so therefore, is verse 17 talking about only the second temple? Or is verse 17 talking about the future? Okay, so let's um, go to a couple other books of the prophets. First book is Zephaniah. That was the book before Haggai in the 12 prophets. Zephaniah, the last verse of Zephaniah. Um, okay, let's go to the actually the Let's go to verse 18. Should be 18. Oh, well, it's, you know, it's really hard to uh, just quote some of it. Okay, so let's go to verse 14 of, of Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14 and on. Sing, O daughter of Zion, sound the trumpet, O Israel, be glad and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Hashem has removed your judgments, He has cleared away your enemy. The king of Israel, Hashem, is in your midst. You will never again fear evil. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, have no fear, O Zion, do not despair. So in that day, so this is connecting to the prophecy of before of you will never again fear evil. Obviously, this is not talking about any time in, in, in Jewish history uh, since the destruction of the first temple, right? So therefore, it's obviously talking about messianic times. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, have no fear, O Zion, do not despair. Hashem, your God is in your midst, the mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be silent with his love. He will be joyful over you with glad song. I have gathered together those who have mourned for the appointed time. They came from you who had carried a burden of shame for it. Behold, at that time, I will crush all those who afflict you. I will save the cripple, gather the cast off, and I will make them for praise and a good name throughout the land of their shame. So God, God is mercy for those who are meek and humbled. At that time, I will bring you in, and at that time, I will gather you, for I will make you into a good name and a praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, said Hashem. Let's look at the last verse in the Hebrew, original prophecy. At that time, I will bring you in. And that time, I will gather you. So I will bring you in at that time. And I will gather you at that time. So why didn't it say Beisei Avia Sechem Bekabetzi Sechem? Why did it say Beisei Avia Sechem Bekabetzi Sechem? So the 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 time is repeated twice. So we're talking about two times. I I suggest the first time I will bring you refers to starting in 1948. And, you know, some, some people came before that, but um, starting in 1948, and then um, in the time out, Kabetzi Yesachem, gather you, that refers to when, when Mashiach comes. And again, according to Rambam, it's the sign of the true Mashiach when the people are gathered in, in, in the second gathering. And the, uh, so in other words, there has to be some people in the exile before Mashiach comes. So if you're wondering why is it taking 70 years just to get half the people to Israel, 
is because you have to have some people collect it, and then you have to have someone who collects the rest. And if there's no one left for the, 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 someone to collect, so we're missing one of the simanim of Mashiach, one of the, the signs of the certain Messiah by, as, as, as written down in, in Maimonides' Laws of King. Okay, now let's continue in the book of Isaiah. Further um, indication of this concept. Chapter 11 in Isaiah, chapter 11 in Isaiah, in the Art Scroll uh, Stone Edition Bilingual Tanakh, that would be page 972, 973. Okay, 974, 975, actually, these verses are there. Okay. Here, verse 11 it talks about it shall be on the day that the Lord will once again show his hand to acquire the remnant of his people who have remained from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, and from Hamath, and, and from the islands of the sea. Islands of the sea could refer to not only Greece, but also England and America, for example. Next verse, he will raise a banner for the nations and assemble the castaways of Israel. He will gather in the, the dispersed ones of Judah from the four corners of the earth. When was Judah in the four corners of the earth? Only in our generation. Uh, and, you know, as far as a time when is, Jews are returning back to Israel. In, in the time of the second temple, they were not in the four corners of the earth only in the four corners of the map, but not in, in, in the, ever, the farthest reaches of the, the earth. Let's look at the verse 12 in Hebrew, the original prophecy. Gather. And remember the, the verse from Sephania. Let's go back to that. You can hold the verse, your finger here if you want to compare them. And here, Unafutsus Yehuda. And before that, so the, we have the language of Asaf Nidichay Israel. So Asaf relates to uh, the, the verse in, in Sephania about Avi. I will bring, I will, I will cause to gather. Assemble the ca castaways of Israel, according to the Arts for Translate. Assemble. So the assembly of Israel and the bring you, I will bring you of Israel has occurred. This prophecy has been fulfilled in the preceding generation. The only thing left is Yikabets. The exact same language, the exact same root word, and in a time I will gather you. And over here, Yehuda, the spread out, those who are spread out from Judah, he will gather from the four corners of the earth. Only possible in a time of returning to Israel, uh, not in, in the days of the second temple, only possible in our days to fulfill this literally. Isaiah 11, Zephania, Zephaniah, Three. Double language of gathering of the Jewish people. Now back to Zechariah 1. Let's 
look at our verses again. Last two verses of Zechariah, chapter one. Therefore, thus said Hashem, I have returned to Jerusalem in mercy. My temple will be rebuilt in it, the word of Hashem, Master of Allegiance. And a plumb line will stretch out, we stretch out over Jerusalem. So the first verse of Zechariah chapter one, discussing about the application of mercy, discusses the building of the temple. So this follows the the um there is a a gemara in uh the jerusalem uh talmud on uh that was in um Meister Shani in the in the second tithe uh, tractate uh that discusses about um the temple being rebuilt possibly uh, by ben israel before mashiach comes so according to this, it's possible to interpret. The first verse corresponds to the first, the Avia uh, Sechem, and the, um, uh, you know, the, the the time when Israel is gathered before the Sheikh comes. How, and I believe Rav Chaim Kanievsky, um, great sage of the previous, sage of the previous generation, uh, held that way that. Um, uh, that he believed that Israel would build the temple before Mashiach comes. But not, not every sage um, has the same opinion. So therefore, let's explain it also according to the other way. If this is referring to when Mashiach comes, so Mashiach first comes before we get this full mercy. So in other words, we haven't even begun the kind of mercy that God intends for us. You know, when God promises peace for eternity and God mentions the importance of the Holy Land, uh, so, you know, people assume you go to the Holy Land, you instantly get peace, you know. But if people are not religious, if they're in fact irreligious, it creates a problem that interferes with God's uh, ability, according to the spiritual physics of this world, to deliver the spiritual rewards for an actively rebellious um, country. There are some people who are religious fully, so therefore maybe in their merit, a lot of the good is occurring. However, it's, it's a mitigation factor that limits the application of the prophecy of, of mercy. So we have not fully seen the mercy. We, we've seen a fulfillment of every aspect of the bringing Israel in the first of the two um, migrations to Israel in the time of Messianic times. But we have not seen the full application of mercy, even according to uh, those like, who hold like Rabbi Chaim, uh, that uh, Bnei Israel would build the temple, not in Mashiach. Uh, so therefore, even according to them, we have not seen the full application of mercy as of yet. Without the temple, half of the commandments are dormant. So it's not a full, you know, it's like a wedding without any wedding cake or something, even more than that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's like a, uh, a mail order wedding, you know, get married online, you know, have a Zoom wedding, you know, so obviously there can't be any honeymoon as, as of yet. Um, so, uh, you know what I'm saying? So we don't yet have the full aspect of mercy in, as of yet. So we can't fully judge this as God's complete redemption so far, even from the, the aspect of uh, dividing the redemption to two phases, as, as I've shown um, Today, even from that aspect, we have not received full mercy as of yet. Uh, 
the mitzvos strengthen a person spiritually and thus physically, and you know, without being able to do God's will, um, it's it's a frustration. It's not it's not a complete aspect of mercy. No, but it's a choice by many people. Most people are not fully religious. So therefore, it's created a spiritual impediment for the rebuilding of the temple. If that in spiritual impediment is too great, so then it will require Mashiach to first come uh, to before the temple can be rebuilt. Now, even though that sounds like a delay to the building of the temple, it, 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 it may be for the best because Midrashically, um, I've seen many different Midrashim on when the temple's rebuilt. And the ones that talk about the temple being rebuilt and never destroyed always mention Mashiach. And there's one that says if, if the children of Israel build it, uh, so then um, rebellious people may get involved. And then that temple could be at risk of being destroyed. So. Um, after all the suffering Israel has been through, I don't, I don't think the building of the temple only to have it destroyed is, is the best thing for them. I think it's better that it's built and not never destroyed. So if it's built uh, by the people, it should be, they should be blessed that it's um, not destroyed. And the best way to not destroy it is simply have Mashiach in, uh, participate in its building. It's, it's a guarantee if, if Mashiach ben David is involved, uh, it, there won't be a destruction. And then verse 17 says, call out, call out again. Thus said Hashem, Master of Legions, my city will once again spread out with bounty. Hashem will have mercy on Zion once again, and he will choose Jerusalem once again. So that Second aspect we haven't gotten to yet, and certainly it's that is waiting for Mashiach time. If the the world is completely the same with or without Mashiach, there is no incentive for someone who's borderline religious to want Mashiach to come. Mashiach will benefit everyone. Let's look again in Isaiah. Chapter 59, chapter 5, 9. Okay, verse 20 of chapter 59 in this Isaiah, in the Art Scroll uh, Stone Edition bilingual, this would be on page 1056, 1057. And this verse is a part of the daily prayers of the Jewish people. Well, it's Yom Goel, Shabbat Fashab Yaakov, Numa Adonai. Banizos Prisio, some Omar, and I Rukesh, Alaha, Parash, or some Picha, Lemushu Picha, Mikarham, Peter Zarakham, Adonai, Miata, but alone. A Redeemer will come to Zion and to those of Jacob who repent from woeful sin, the word of Hashem. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, said Hashem. My spirit, which is upon you, and my words that I have placed in your mouth, will not be drawn, withdrawn, will not be withdrawn from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring. 
nor from the mouth of your offspring, offspring's offspring, from Tzed Hashem, from this moment and forever. A, a redeemer will come to Zion and th to those of Jacob who repent from mortal sin. So there will be a benefit to have Mashiach, whether or not people repent. See, so you notice it, Zion will have a benefit of, of, of a redeemer. And then it discusses human repenting in the second half. Those who repent from willful sin. Why is it separated? Okay, if if uh, Mashiach is bringing benefits to Israel, whether or not people repent, he's going to be a good king. People will want him to stay, you know, as their king, uh, you know, for life. So then, why is there uh, an aspect of people who repent? So. There's more than one uh, answer to this. First of all, although it's a benefit, people won't fully appreciate the depth of, of what Mashiach is bringing unless they have an aspect of religiosity. If they understand Mashiach is creating a, a spiritual bridge to, to the next world uh, that will um, enhance the quality of, of the uh, redemption. Secondly, the name Jacob sometimes is connected uh, to uh, to Israel in, in exile. So in other words, to benefit from Mashiach uh, as a secular Jew, one would have to live in the Holy Land. But uh, to benefit from, from Mashiach outside the Holy Land, uh, people would have to become more religious to fully appreciate what he's doing. Because otherwise, from a secular perspective, okay, he's doing good for that country, but we still have uh, uh, problems over here or something, you know, that kind of an attitude. Uh, but if people are, so if they look at it from secular political leadership, uh, they'll think that uh, Israel's lucky to have a good leader like that. But that's not appreciating Mashiach. However, if someone in, in exile lands was religious, they would say, my goodness, the prophecies are coming true, or something like that. It's, it's an entirely different level. And so verses 20 and 21 of Isaiah 59 are the only verses from Isaiah that we say every single day. And 20, verse 21 guarantees that from the time of Isaiah, there won't be a change of, um, of the law. Now, it was already... Um, verified in the Torah that we should not uh, change the law. But here, it's a guarantee that this word will, will not be lost. That um, not just the, the law is on the books, but that the book will remain with you forever. So that means it will always be a remnant of Israel, no matter uh, what any nation tries to do to destroy Israel. It also seals uh, monotheism to the days of Isaiah, that um, if in Isaiah's days they're not rejecting the law of Moses, you know, and from that day on, the word will never be lost. So therefore, any attempt to alter the words of Isaiah would be a clear sign of heresy. And just look at the King James Bible. Uh, many words of Isaiah have been altered there. That's why we use Masoretic text, first generation translation of the original Hebrew prophecy. Uh, King James borrows from sources and uh, different uh, translations, and in some places up to three generations or more uh, from the original Hebrew.
Okay, a couple more verses from Isaiah before we call it a class and then take the questions and answers if there's any. So in verse, in chapter 56 of Isaiah, chapter 56, uh, verse 7, I'll bring them to my holy mountain and I will gladden them in my house of prayer. The elevation offerings and their peace offerings will find favor on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all people, all the peoples. So God has to have a house of prayer. And there has to be sacrifices there. So if it is my house of prayer, as God says, uh, then it will be a house of prayer for all peoples. But if it is not God's house of prayer, it will not. Okay, so let's read um, from verse uh, 14 of chapter 57 of Isaiah, verse 14, until the end of the chapter. This is uh, the starting of the Haftar for Yom Kippur. Very uh, important prophecy. He will say, pave, pave, clear the road, remove the obstacle from my people's path. Rashi says that refers to the evil inclination that in, inside of people that, that keeps them from repenting. But thus said the exalted and uplifted one who abides forever and whose name is holy. I abide in exaltedness and holiness, but I am with the despondent and lowly of spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly to revive the heart of the despondent. For not forever will I contend, nor will I be eternally wrathful when the spirit that envelops them is from me and I made them and I made their souls. I became angry because of his sinful thievery. I struck him. I hid myself and became angry because he continued waywardly in the path of his heart. But when I see his contrite ways, I will heal him. I will guide him and recompense him and his mourners with, with consolations. I will create the speech of the lips, peace, peace from, for, for the far and near, said Hashem. And I will heal him, but the wicked will be like the driven sea that cannot rest and whose waters disgorge in mire and mud. There is no peace, said my God, for the wicked. So to have peace of Mashiach time, we cannot be wicked. We have to be righteous. And righteous means that God will now be able to bless us with true peace certain peace for the far and the near far spiritually or far physically peace will will spread throughout the world when there's peace in zion 
why is God angry of sinful thievery? You know, before we're usually we're talking about idolatry or, or one of the other severe sins. Why thievery, which is very bad, but it's not as bad as like murder or idolatry. Because when a Jew doesn't act as a Jew, they are not the nation of priests. And if they're not of the nation of priests, they can't fulfill their role to bring blessing to the world. And when there's blessing in the world, then it's easier for the Gentiles to serve God as well. Now, in the old days, when the Gentiles, the nations as a whole, collectively, not individuals, were, were seeking idolatry. So, uh, you know, it, there's only so much you could blame Israel for, even if they were sinning. But now Israel has a chance to help the entire world serve Hashem. If Israel serves Hashem, the entire world will get blessings. And they'll see it started when Israel was serving Hashem, when Sheikh came, uh, and all these good things happen. And so it'll be a great honor to God, and it'll be a great source of bringing people closer to God when these things happen. No peace is possible for the wicked. So this explains why peace plans have not worked uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the past when you're assuming that Israel is a sinner, is wicked, so those peace plans never worked. When there were more objective standards, uh, for example, with the Abraham Accords, uh, so then peace started to work. But the, there's a spiritual opportunity now. Uh, you know, Mashiach is coming soon, so we should participate in bringing more and more spirituality and then true peace can occur, only can occur, when people are connected to God. And so that's my recommendation. Any questions? Are you saying that, that, that the Mashiach is not going to come before every person in this world? Are you saying every person in this world? Uh, no, uh, Mashiach has to come for people to repent. Because there's over a thousand religions. How do people know which one represents God correctly? Right. And, and many of the religions uh, say that even people of their own religion are doomed. <laughs> unless they, they, they very specifically are very righteous in very certain ways. Uh, so the, the concept of God being merciful is not fully understood and um, you know these verses attach mercy and peace to serving God right mm -hmm. and to Mashiach time so it's it's important that when Mashiach comes we're not just waiting for a good leader to be in Israel if if our attitude is secular so we won't fully appreciate Mashiach even when he comes. And then, and then when suddenly world peace happens and, you know, we weren't there for it because we were just thinking secular about it. So it's like, um, what an opportunity to be in the historic moment of world history and to not be at the party. It's, you know, it's kind of sad to even think about it. We have the opportunity to join uh, to join the party in the right way, and um, you know, if someone's uh, engaged in another mitzvah here in, in, in the exile, they could still uh, connect to Mashiach and appreciate him because of the their dedication to the Torah and mitzvahs. Each person at their level, and um, thank God, it's it's just. Uh, when things are on the way, but we have to also be prepared to um, up our game spiritually, ethically, morally, and uh, good things will surely occur. Uh, surely, <laughs> and everyone. Uh, any uh, further questions?
Any other questions? Remember to unmute your mic if you want to ask a question. Okay. I guess we'll call it a class for now. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Very good tonight. Mm. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank God. <laughs> Bye. Be well. Shabuato. Shabuato. Good to us. <laughs>